irony uh, to be able to have this hearing ahead of the transmission of these articles. Uh, and he said that it wasn't. You know, keep in mind, this was the committee that led the impeachment investigation against Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, this is the same committee that you drafted these two articles. Uh, so Chairman Green thought, very confident in moving forward with this process, even as we prepare to hear these articles read aloud in the well of the Senate. There is the prospect that this trial could potentially be dismissed. We don't expect a trial to begin today. We expect senators to be sworn in tomorrow. Uh, but there is a lot of speculation about whether there will even be a trial since mm. the leader Chuck Schumer has made clear he believes this is more an issue of policy disagreements with respect to the border and the secretary's handling of the border and these articles. Uh, and so he wants this matter resolved quickly. Uh, but on the other hand, you have Senate Republicans, many of whom are pushing for a full trial. So uh, we don't know exactly <laughs> which option uh, will advance, uh, but that is uh, the path forward as we wait for these articles to be brought over from the House to the Senate. So one thing that uh, Nicole mentioned there and that I want to bring Scott in for is Nicole is talking about, you know, this is, according to, to Chuck Schumer and many Democrats, just a policy issue, not a, a crimes or high crimes and misdemeanor issue. Scott, can you walk us through why is this historic? Uh, why have we not seen a cabinet member, at least in all of our lifetimes, uh, go through this? And what would be the implications moving forward if this trial were to succeed? And the Democrats here today are making just that argument, Lilia, that this needs to be snuffed out, that this needs to be discarded with in matter of minutes tomorrow by the U.S. Senate, so as not to set a precedent for what they say are policy disputes to metastasize into impeachments. So they say the Senate needs to be quick in dispatching this so as not to send a message that this type of thing is acceptable. And the Republicans are arguing that when you approve an impeachment as a U.S. House, there's a burden, there's a responsibility on the Senate to hear things out, to at least review the evidence, review the arguments, and not make fast work with it. But I think there's a consensus among the senators with whom I'm speaking today that they're about to march these impeachment articles over into a dead end, that it's not headed anywhere in the U.S. Senate, controlled by Democrats, where Democrats are urging to defuse this political bomb. And when you watch this group of 11 impeachment managers walk across the Capitol in a few minutes, you're going to see some of Donald Trump's most ardent loyalists and supporters. And some of this march may seem familiar because we've seen it twice before since 2020 in the two impeachments of former President Trump. In fact, the second impeachment was, of course, over his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Some of these managers were part of the people denying the election results that led to that second impeachment. This is a Republican Party initiative. You will not see a bipartisan group today. This is a party line vote to approve it. And I want to bring in Camilo. Camilo, you've, of course, been following this uh, and also what's been happening along the border. Uh, Camilo, within the, uh, within the House resolution, it reads, throughout his tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mallorca has repeatedly violated laws enacted by Congress regarding immigration and border security, large part because of his unlawful conduct. And they accuse him or they say it is his fault that millions have crossed into the U.S. illegally goes uh, on to accuse him of other things. So talk to us first about the numbers. I know that you've been following the numbers closely. And second, what is it exactly he's being accused of violent, uh, violating, legally speaking? Well, Lilia, multiple things are true. It is true, on one hand, that there have been record levels of migrant apprehension since the Biden administration took office, since President Biden took office in January of 2021. Seven million migrant encounters have been recorded over the past three years. That is true, but that does not mean that seven million migrants are here right now in the country illegally or that this represents unique individuals, because many of these encounters represent multiple crossings by the same migrants, and especially when Title 42, that pandemic era order was in place because migrants were expelled to Mexico, Lilia, and as you know, many of them tried to cross back into the U.S. multiple times and were counted in those tallies multiple times. In addition, the Biden administration has carried out roughly 4 million deportations and expulsions over this time span, too. So not everyone who was processed at the border is still here in the U.S. and seeking asylum. But it is true that many people 
An estimated 3 million migrants have been released with court notices and are now awaiting their asylum hearings and a decision on their cases. That is true. In terms of what the secretary is being accused of, he's essentially being accused of being responsible for the crisis at the border and these record levels of migration. Republicans are arguing that this crisis at the border is directly stemming from policies implemented by Mayorkas and President Biden. They want the administration to implement policies like remain in Mexico, that policy mm -hmm. that required migrants to await their hearings outside of the U.S. and only to come back when they were granted asylum, or policies like Title 42, that, mm -hmm. again, public health order that allowed the U.S. to summarily expel migrants. But the CDC, for example, has already said that Title 42 is no longer justified on public health grounds, and the Supreme Court has ruled that the Biden administration does not need to re-implement Remain in Mexico if it does not want to. It is a discretionary, not a mandatory authority. Republicans also want Mayorkas to detain all migrants who are seeking asylum pending a decision on their cases, Lilia. Right. But Mayorkas and the administration would argue that it does not have enough detention beds, ICE officers and asylum officers to implement this, and that the U.S. has never had enough detention beds to detain everyone who is coming along the U.S.-Mexico border. So you can argue that every DHS secretary in U.S. history has mm -hmm. violated Violated this detention provision that Republicans want the administration to enforce. And so I think it is very telling this moment in Congress because, on one hand, Congress, instead of coming together and trying to forge a compromise on immigration and updating the system for the first time since the 1990s, they're instead focusing on impeaching Secretary Mayorkas, who, again, has not been accused of any personal misconduct. It, this is basically disagreements on right. policy matters. And I want to bring back Nicole to talk about this, because, because Nicole, you were covering so closely uh, the, the failure of that bipartisan bill that looked to resolve some of these issues and, and deal with the crisis or so-called crisis of the border, if you will. Talk to us about, you know, when you look at what's happening here, the impeachment, the historic uh, impeachment of a cabinet member, he's being accused of not following the law. Uh, what Camila just talked about are, are policies that are determined in Congress, uh, that have been fought in the courts, not, you know, personal violations of law by the secretary uh, in, in his own duties. And this is what the, what the Democrats are, are alleging and are saying. Talk to us a little bit about what are some of those issues that are, were perhaps possibly resolved back then when that bill came forward and and was uh, and Republicans decided to to fail it. Yeah, well, you know, this set off a wave of disappointment, particularly among those three senators: uh, Senator Kirsten Cinema, Senator uh, Lankford, as well as uh, Senator Chris Murphy, who worked extensively for several months trying to craft this bipartisan compromise that they felt would uh, begin to address the situation at the border, uh, in particular by uh, starting to limit uh, the flow of migrants at the border and to reform the asylum system, which are reforms that many uh, Republicans had called for. But uh, at the end of the day, we know that former President uh, Donald Trump was very influential to a certain extent in this process uh, in the sense of uh, wanting to see this bill killed. And subsequently, we saw uh, that in the House was unwilling to take this matter up, and then it was almost like dominoes, where mm -hmm. Senate Republicans then started backing away from this agreement to the point where it just simply couldn't advance in the U.S. Senate. I think it survived for all of about 24 hours from the time this proposal was introduced uh, before it was officially dead in both chambers. And, uh, you know, I think it does... Uh, really draw attention to what many say uh, and feel uh, is a broken and dysfunctional Congress in the sense of uh, this inability at times to be able to work together and work across the aisle. One would think an independent, a Republican, a Democrat, all coming together, uh, that that is how things typically work or should work in this body. Um, but uh, that is not always possible in this particular era of divided government. And so that is why we saw that border deal completely fall apart. And then subsequent to that, we have since seen 
House Republicans in particular continue to insist that border security be part of any type of package going forward. In fact, just today, uh, Speaker Johnson reiterated that right. he feels that addressing uh, the border is essential and House Republicans' number one priority. But, you know, it is not... Uh, not part of that foreign uh, funding deal that he was talking about, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there was this impetus to try to attach it to foreign aid, and, and that didn't necessarily work or, or pan out. So uh, the reality is that at some point, and we know Congress for years and years and years has been trying to address uh, the issue of uh, comprehensive immigration reform, um, as well as dealing with the more acute issues of, of border security, but it remains a very huge challenge uh, in this body. And so subsequently, once again, nothing has, has yet been done on that front. And, and that's really the key argument uh, that Secretary Mayorkas and the Department of Homeland Security is making. You know, keep in mind, Secretary Mayorkas actually was very instrumental in the border negotiations uh, earlier this year. And so the Department of Homeland Security's position is, look, Congress, you need to do the work and you need to get it done instead of wasting time on what we believe is a mm. basement, baseless, right. uh, rather, right. uh, impeachment. Yeah. So, not you know, to that is kind of that, that tension yeah. between, you know, not only Congress, but the secretary as well, who has tried to keep his blinders on uh, to this process as it plays out, uh, constantly telling reporters he's not focused on the politics, but trying to stay focused on the policy yeah. in terms of dealing with the situation at the border. And it, as always, things stuck at the border, not policies and politics beyond in the region where people are fleeing from. We are going to continue covering this. We're going to take just a short break, and we will be back with our team coverage of this historic attempt uh, of impeachment. We'll see uh, where it's headed. Just stay with us. We're, we're going to come back in just a few. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To so land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. 
I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. We continue following developments from Capitol Hill where the articles of impeachment against the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas are being transmitted uh, to the Senate. We have a team coverage there. I want to bring in Scott McFarland. Scott, uh, we were just talking about why this is historic and uh, what are the risks of dealing with policy differences uh, among legislators in this quite dramatic way, uh, if you will, because this is something we have not seen in this country in over 100 years, a cabinet member being accused uh, of high crimes and misdemeanors because of discrepancies and or because of accusations of not following existing law. I am curious about what happens if this impeachment moves forward, uh, if it if it goes anywhere in the Senate, which according to experts and you yourself were talking about it earlier, it's unlikely because Democrats are a majority in the Senate. Um, what kind of precedent does this set for those joining us now? Uh, now? Lilia, I mean, the critics of this have been unambiguous. They say that having this impeachment approved in the U.S. House, transmitted to the Senate, and some proceeding in the Senate tomorrow sets a precedent that others might follow in the future. They argue it's a policy dispute, and this could give rise to more impeachment over policy disputes. Of course, the impeachment managers and the Republicans who voted for this have a much different argument. They're saying that this is an issue of breaching the public's trust and failing to follow immigration law, which they characterize as fitting as a high crime and misdemeanor. But there's another political impact of all this. It, it does, to a degree, water down the word impeachment which is in the Republicans' interest as they are fit to nominate a twice-impeached former president to be their White House nominee in 2024. Um, that's the political reality of all this. But the theater is required. What happens here, the order of events, is following custom and protocol. And when you watch the impeachment managers walk across with the articles, you're going to see some new faces, some rather high-ranking people who are otherwise anonymous to America. Kevin McCumber is the acting House clerk new to that position. The House Sergeant at Arms will lead this group. His name is William McFarland, no relation. <laughs> and the Senate Sergeant at Arms will receive this group. She's Karen Gibson. And they would otherwise be anonymous players in all this, but it's worth noting they're all relatively new to the job because everybody in those positions, the Sergeants at Arms and other high-ranking officials in Congress, were ousted after the January 6th attack and the failures to secure the Capitol. The acting clerk's a different mm. person, different role, but he'll be among the group as well. And, Scott, how likely is this trial to even take place? Well, can you measure it by minutes or can you measure it by hours? <laughs> I asked Tom Tillis, a Republican on the Judiciary Committee in the U.S. Senate, what are the odds there's any extended deliberations or trial? And he said virtually none. Peter Welch, Democrat from Vermont, also on that Judiciary panel, relatively new to the U.S. Senate in his first term, said None when I asked him the prospects of having an extended trial. They're not even leaving open the door for the possibility. Um, this is going to be a short lived process in the U.S. Senate. It just depends on your meaning of the word short. Camilo, I want to bring you in because uh, I was just reading that some of some of what is alleged uh, in the in the articles is that because of the failures that um, the secretary is being accused of, of things like not following the law, not implementing the law accordingly by ending MPP, as you said, or the migrant, um, uh, or, or, or cat, uh, not catch and release. Catch and release is what he's being accused of for the Remain in Mexico policy and, and, a, and a range of other things that Americans have been put in danger because Border Patrol agents are too busy processing migrants as opposed to protecting the border from cartels trafficking in drugs. 
That I found interesting because I recall Border Patrol uh, asking for funding, supporting uh, this, this bill that Nicole was talking about, this bipartisan bill, which was uh, failed and, and, and thereby not allotting the funding that they need to hire more agents. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what is it that the department needs to do for the crisis to be tamed that is not being done and that Mayorkas is being accused of? That's right, Lilia. The bipartisan compromise that the White House and President Biden struck with that bipartisan group of senators in Congress would have not only revamped U.S. asylum law, but it would have given the Department of Homeland Security billions in dollars to fund border operations, including to better interdict fentanyl, to hire more asylum officers, deportation agents, and border patrol agents, and also to increase the tension space capacity, which is obviously at center in this impeachment charge against President uh, against Mayorkas, rather, because he is being accused of not detaining enough migrants. It is also important to note that this bipartisan compromise included many asylum policies that have been pushed by Republicans for years and decades. It would have restricted asylum eligibility. It would have created this power for the president to just expel people back to Mexico, no questions asked, when illegal crossings soar to a certain threshold, similar to the Title 42 mm -hmm. policy. And it would also have sped up asylum reviews, which right now is an issue that Democrats and Republicans agree is something that needs to be tackled, because migrants are on average waiting four years to have their cases adjudicated, and that is bad for everyone. It's bad for the people who have legitimate cases, Lilia, because they're in legal limbo for years. It's bad for the people who don't have cases because they're stuck in this limbo and, ultimately, they're denied. And at that point, it's very hard to remove them from the country. And it's also bad for the government, because that, in some ways, attracts migration from people who are not asylum seekers. So, the deal in Congress would have gotten to address many of these concerns that Republicans have. But, obviously, after former President Trump came out against the deal, that prompted many Republican lawmakers to follow suit and to reject that proposal categorically. In terms of what the Department of Homeland Security has to do to deal with the crisis at the southern border, it depends on who you ask. If you ask Republicans, the administration needs to return to Trump-era border policies like Remain in Mexico, Title 42, and asylum agreements that allow the U.S. to reroute migrants to different countries in Central America. But if you ask the Biden administration, Lilia, you have to combine legal immigration pathways to give yeah. people an opportunity to come here legally with heightened consequences for people who decide to ignore U.S. asylum law and to cross the border illegally. And the administration has actually, unbeknownst to a lot of people, restricted asylum through a rule that it published last year. People right now who cross in between ports of entry and who don't have a CBP-1 app appointment through a smartphone are actually barred from mm -hmm. asylum. And many of the cases are rejected outright when they're in Border Patrol custody. But again, the administration does not have enough asylum officers and the tension space to implement mm -hmm. that rule at scale. So, uh, at you know, at a very basic level, this is a policy dispute, but what the Biden administration is arguing is that it needs the resources to do many of the things that Republicans are calling for. And even with solutions like CBP-1, as you mentioned, Camilo, I mean, there are countless numbers of migrants who are waiting for their appointments for a very long time, precisely uh, because of these resources that are lacking or stuck. I want to bring uh, Nicole back in, because, Nicole, one thing that I cover, and, of course, I cover immigration here in the city of New York, where there was this, there is this backlog, and where I used to meet so many migrants from places like Venezuela, who now have temporary protected status and are now being able to work. Not all of them, the ones that came in before a certain deadline. Those are the kinds of policies that seem to help everybody, uh, the employees, the employers, the people who are fleeing their country uh, for a number of reasons. What are some of the initiatives that are being done in collaboration with countries like Mexico or with countries like Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, where people are fleeing, that are being currently either debated or stuck somewhere in Congress while we're sitting here witnessing uh, all of the theatrics, as uh, Scott said it, of an impeachment? 
Well, I do want to just update you that uh, we do believe that the articles of impeachment should be making their way over to the Senate any minute now. We yep. understand that votes have wrapped up in the House, so uh, we are being told that the process should get underway shortly. So I will try to be brief. But uh, what I do want to point out, though, as we discussed earlier, when it comes to uh, the issue of border security, immigration reform, you know, one uh, reason that there has been such a stumbling block in terms of trying to advance any legislation, in particular on the part of House Republicans, is that they continue to insist that they want H.R. 2, which is a package that they passed many months ago. Uh, and they continue to insist that that really is the only path forward, which we know is dead on arrival in the Senate. But, for instance, uh, that would be restoring the Remain in Mexico policy. Uh, they believe in ending catch and release uh, policy. So those are some of the uh, aspects of any type of border security or immigration reform legislation they feel has to include those components. And that's why time and again, we continue to kind of see this end run, no matter what gets put forth. If it doesn't meet that standard of that H.R. 2 legislation, then House Republicans don't want to move forward with it. So that has been kind of that tug of war uh, between both the House and the Senate. It's part of why that uh, border compromise package did not succeed that we talked about earlier, even though it did uh, try to address uh, some of those policies. And so that continues to be uh, the dynamic that we witness on Capitol Hill. And so um, as we await uh, the articles to be transmitted, uh, you know, that is part of the broader debate that needs to happen in this body, which is why you have heard leaders like Chuck Schumer say that we need to take a different path to resolving yeah. policy differences, that this is not the vehicle to do it uh, by moving forward uh, with these articles of impeachment. And I want to bring in Camilo, because, Camilo, you've been covering uh, the border for, for a bit, and you, you were just, for a long time, but you were just very recently in Texas, in Arizona. You have been documenting how the numbers in southern Texas of people crossing have come down, uh, and in part that has to do with Mexico's policies. So I kind of want to get us uh, beyond the border, if you will, to talk about, you know, how does that work? How has that been working? I understand that the U.S. has been assisting in some ways uh, governments like Guatemala and, um, and Ecuador, whether it's in safety uh, or otherwise, to, to deal with the number of people needing to come into the U.S. and, and crossing and putting their lives at, at, at risk. So talk to me a little bit about those policies that you've been covering and, and what you've observed while at the border. Lilia, as you know, in the spring, we usually see a spike in migration along the U.S.-Mexico border. But there has been a remarkable and unusual trend over the past few months. Border crossings there have actually gone down despite these historical trends. And U.S. officials are telling me, Lilia, that the main catalyst for that trend is this aggressive crackdown that the Mexican government has been staging in its territory to stop migrants from reaching American soil in the first place. Right now, we understand that Mexican officials and guardsmen have been deployed to areas of Mexico in Tapachula, in Chiapas, in northern Mexico, to stop migrants from getting on buses and trains that would get them further into Mexico and closer to the U.S. They're also deporting more migrants to southern Mexico, closer to the Guatemala-Mexico border. And so right now, Mexico is doing a lot of immigration enforcement and has sustained that effort since December. And that is the main reason that U.S. officials are citing for the decreased flows in migration to uh, the U.S.-Mexico border. In terms of— Camilo, do you want to say something, wanna, Lilia? Please. I, I just want to make sure, because uh, Nicole is— I'm seeing some activity. I'm seeing uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Can you talk to us about what's going on right now? Is this the articles of impeachment uh, being transferred? Well, we know that that procession does appear to be beginning. It has not reached the Capitol Rotunda just yet, where I am located, but we are seeing some activity begin to pick up with a few members of law enforcement uh, walking through at this time. But as I mentioned earlier, we were waiting for the House to wrap up its votes, uh, which it appears they have done. And I do now see uh, those impeachment managers starting to make their way into the Capitol Rotunda. Again, you've got uh, managers, uh, Mark Green, the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, Marjorie Taylor Green, Congressman Michael McCall, on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, along with a number of other members. Uh, they are making that solemn trek 
uh, no one speaking, just quietly walking with the articles in hand carried by the House clerk. They have now gone through the rotunda and are now making their way over to the Senate chamber, where we do expect the articles of impeachment will be read aloud in the well of the Senate while the impeachment managers are there in the chamber, at which point, once those, once those articles are read aloud, we expect the House managers to return back to the House chamber. I also want to point out, Lilia, that as they do this, there has been some debate among both Republican and Democratic leadership, according to North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis, about potentially allowing a debate about whether mm. this trial should move forward first before moving ahead with a motion to dismiss it or table it, that if senators can come or leadership can come to some type of time agreement to allow for debate, that that might uh, satisfy some concerns mm. that members have. Mm. Uh, so that is a discussion underway, although we don't know what the next course of action may be with respect to that. Scott, uh, if you don't mind setting the scene a little bit again here and uh, telling us what comes next. We are witnessing a historic moment, a cabinet member uh, who is, is impeached in, in, in the House, and now these articles of impeachment are being uh, transferred to the Senate. Can you talk to us about what, what we are expecting in the next minutes? And I've seen some version of this now three times since 2020, the two previous impeachments of former President Trump and this one. And what always strikes you is how these areas that you just watched, like Statuary Hall and the Capitol Rotunda, typically filled with tourists with all the marble are usually the loudest places this side of a preschool at lunchtime. And it was deafening silence um, as this goes through. And that's been the case all three times. So there's a solemnity to this. But this one seems to have a more predictable outcome than the prior uh, impeachment, where there's a sense that there may be a limited debate that lasts hours tomorrow. There may be, before there's some move to dismiss this outright. It's a matter of how long, but there's just zero expectation of an extended proceeding, an extended trial, the likes of which we've watched twice since 2020. But you have here um, a procedure the House Republicans wanted America to see. They knew when they voted to approve this impeachment that they were going to have this moment um, to raise the issue, to raise their concerns about the Homeland Security Secretary, his performance, the issue of border security. But I'll also acknowledge, and I suspect Nicole would agree with me here, that they've also trampled on their message a bit today because this day began with a second House Republican saying he'd be open to ousting the House Speaker. And the House Speaker has spent much of this day answering questions about that and not about the Homeland Security Secretary. There is certainly irony in that. And we were covering those two stories back to back. I was wondering, I mean, how do you make um, a, a case, a coherent case for one or the other at the same time? Um, Let's take a moment to listen to what's happening now, and uh, we'll come back with much more analysis from our team coverage there in Capitol Hill. The Sergeant in Ar Arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment, while the House of Representatives is exhibiting to the Senate of the United States articles of impeachment against Alejandro Nicholas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security. The managers on the part of the House will proceed. Mr. President, the managers on the part of the House of Representatives are present and ready to present the articles of impeachment, which have been preferred by the House of Representatives against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. The House adopted the following resolution, which will, with permission of the Senate, I will read House Resolution 995. <clears throat> Resolved that Mr. Green of Tennessee, Mr. McCall, Mr. Biggs, Mr. Higgins of Louisiana, Mr. Klein, Mr. Guest, Mr. Garbarino, Ms. Green of Georgia, Mr. Pfluger, Ms. Hageman, and Ms. Lee of Florida are appointed managers to conduct the impeachment trial against Alejandro Nicholas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security, that a message be sent to the Senate to inform the Senate of these appointments, and that the managers so appointed may, in connection 
with the preparation and the conduct of the trial, exhibit the articles of impeachment to the Senate and take all necessary actions, which may include the following. One, employing legal, clerical, and other necessary assistance and incurring such other expenses as may be necessary to be paid from amounts available to the Committee on Homeland Security under applicable expense resolutions or for the applicable amounts of the House of Representatives. Two, sending for persons and papers and filing with the Secretary of the Senate on the part of the House of Representatives any pleadings in conjunction with or subsequent to the exhibition of the articles of impeachment that the managers consider necessary. With the permission of the Senate, I will now read the articles of impeachment, House Resolution 863. Resolved that Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security of the United States of America, is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, and that the following articles of impeachment be exhibited to the United States Senate. Articles of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives of the United States of America in the name of itself and the people of the United States of America against Alejandro N. Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security of the United States of America, in maintenance and support of its impeachment against him for high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 1, willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives, quote, shall have the sole power of impeachment, end quote, and that civil officers of the United States, including the Secretary of Homeland Security, quote, shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. In his conduct while Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro N. Mayorkas, in violation of his oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and to well and faithfully discharge the duties of his office, has willfully and systemically refused to comply with the federal immigration laws in that. Throughout his tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro N. Mayorkas has repeatedly violated laws enacted by Congress regarding immigration and border security. In large part because of his unlawful conduct, millions of aliens have illegally entered the United States on an annual basis, with many unlawfully remaining in the United States. His refusal to obey the law is not only an offense against the separation of powers in the Constitution of the United States, it also threatens our national security and has had a dire impact on communities across the country. Despite clear evidence that his willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law has significantly contributed to unprecedented levels of illegal immigrants, entrance, the increased control of the southwest border by drug cartels, and the imposition of enormous costs on states and localities affected by the influx of aliens, Alejandro N. Mayorkas has continued in his refusal to comply with the law and thereby acted to the grave detriment of the interests of the United States. Alejandro N. Mayorkas engaged in this scheme or course of conduct through the following means. One, Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in Section 235B2A of the Immigration and Nationality Act requiring that all applicants for admission who are, quote, not clearly and beyond a doubt entitled to be admitted shall be detained for a removal proceeding, end quote. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas implemented a catch and release scheme whereby such aliens were unlawfully released even without effective mechanisms to ensure appearance before the immigration courts for removal proceedings or to ensure removal in the case of aliens ordered removed. Two, Alejandro Mayork N. Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in Section 235B1B2 of such act, requiring that an alien who is placed into expedited removal proceedings and determined to have a credible fear of persecution, quote, shall be detained for further consideration of the application for asylum, end quote. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas implemented a catch and release scheme whereby such aliens were unlawfully released, even without effective mechanisms, to ensure appearances before the immigration courts for removal, 
proceedings or to ensure removal in the case of aliens ordered removed. Three, Alejandro and Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention set forth in section 235B1B34 of such act, requiring that an alien who is placed into expedited removal proceedings and determined not to have a credible fear of persecution, quote, shall be detained until removed, end quote. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas has implemented a catch and release scheme whereby such aliens are unlawfully released, even without effective mechanisms to ensure appearance before the immigration courts for removal proceedings or to ensure removal in the case of aliens ordered removed. Four, Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in section 236C of such act, requiring that a criminal alien who is inadmissible or deportable on certain criminal and terrorism-related grounds, quote, shall be taken into custody, end quote, when the alien is released from law enforcement custody. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas issued, quote, guidelines for the enforcement of civil immigration laws, end quote, which instructs Department of Homeland Security, here, hereinafter referred to as DHS, officials that the, quote, Fact an individual is a removable non-citizen should not alone be the basis of an enforcement action against them, end quote. And that DHS, quote, personnel should not rely on the fact of conviction alone, end quote. Even with respect to aliens subject to mandatory arrest and detention pursuant to section 236C of such act to take them into custody. In Texas versus the United States, 40 F 4th 205, 2022, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit concluded that these guidelines had, quote, every indication of being a general policy that is so extreme as to amount to an abdication of statutory responsibility, end quote. And that is, quote, replacement of Congress's statutory mandates with concerns of equity and race is extra legal and plainly outside the bounds of the power conferred by the INA, end quote. Number five, Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in section 241A2 of such act, requiring that an alien ordered removed, quote, shall be detained, quote, during, quote, the removal period, end quote. Instead of complying with this mandate, Alejandro Mayor N. Mayorkas issued, quote, guidelines for the enforcement of civil immigration laws, end quote, which instructs DHS officials that the Quote, fact an individual is removable non-citizen should not alone be the basis of an enforcement action against them, end quote, and that DHS, quote, personnel should not rely on the fact of conviction alone, end quote, even with respect to aliens subject to mandatory detention and removal pursuant to section 241A of such act. Six, Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully exceeded his parole authority set forth in section 212D5A of such act that permits parole to be granted, quote, only on a case-by-case -case basis, end quote, temporarily and, quote, for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit, end quote, in that, A, Alejandro N. Mayorkas paroled aliens en masse in order to release them from mandatory detention despite the fact that as the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit concluded in Texas versus Biden, 20 F 4th 928, 2021, quote, paroling every alien DHS cannot detain is the opposite of the case-by-case -case basis determinations required by law, end quote. And quote, DHS's pretended power to parole aliens while ignoring the limitations Congress imposed on the parole power is not non-enforcement. It's misenforcement, suspension of the INA, or both. B, Alejandro N. Mayorkas created, reopened, or expanded a series of categorical parole programs never authorized by Congress for foreign nationals outside the United States including for certain Central American minors, Ukrainians, Venezuelans, Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, Colombians, Salvadorans, Guatemalans, and Hondurans, 
which enabled hundreds of thousands of inadmissible aliens to enter the United States in violation to the laws enacted by Congress. Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully exceeded his release authority set forth in Section 236A of such act that permits, in certain circumstances, the release of aliens arrested on an administrative warrant in that Alejandro N. Mayorkas released aliens arrested without a warrant despite their being subject to a separate applicable mandatory detention requirement set forth in Section 235B2 of such act. Alejandro N. Mayorkas released such aliens by retroactively issuing administrative warrants in an attempt to circumvent Section 235B2 of such act. In Florida versus the United States, number 321 CV 1066, Tango Kilo Whiskey, Zulo Charlie Bravo, Northern District of Florida, March 8, 2023, the United States District Court of the Northern District of Florida noted, and I quote, this sleight of hand using an arrest warrant as a de facto release warrant is administrative sophistry at its worst, end quote. In addition, the court concluded that, quote, what makes DHS's application of 236A in this manner unlawful is that 235B2, not 236A, governs the detention of applicants for admission whom DHS places in removal proceedings after inspection. Alejandro N. Mayorkas's willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law has had a calamitous consequence for the nation and the people of the United States, including one, during fiscal year 2017 through 2020, an average of about 590,000 aliens each fiscal year were encountered as in inadmissible aliens at ports of entry on the southwest border or apprehended between ports of entry. Thereafter, during Alejandro N. Mayorkas's tenure in office, that number skyrocketed to over 1,400,000 in fiscal year 2021, over 2 million, 300,000 in fiscal year 2022, and over 2,400,000 in fiscal year 2023. Similarly, during fiscal years 2017 through 2020, an average of 130,000 persons who were not turned back or apprehended after making an illegal entry were observed along the border each fiscal year. During Alejandro N. Mayorkas's tenure in office, that number more than trebled to 400,000 in fiscal year 2021, 600,000 in fiscal year 2022, 750,000 in fiscal year 2023. Two, American communities both along the southwest border and across the United States have been devastated by the dramatic growth in illegal entrants. The number of aliens unlawfully present and substantial rise in the number of aliens unlawfully granted parole creating a fiscal and humanitarian crisis and dramatically degrading the quality of life of residents of those communities. For example, since 2022, more than 150,000 migrants have gone through New York City's shelter intake system. Indeed, the mayor of New York City has said that, quote, we are past our breaking point, end quote, and that, quote, this issue will destroy New York City, end quote. In fiscal year 2023, New York City spent $1 billion, $450 million, addressing Alejandro N. Mayorkas' migrant crisis. And city officials fear it will spend another $12 billion over the following three fiscal years, causing painful budget cuts to important city services. Three, Alejandro N. Mayorkas' unlawful mass release of apprehended aliens and unlawful mass grant of categorical parole to aliens have enticed an increasing number of aliens to make the dangerous journey to our southwest border. Consequently, according to the United Nations International Organization for Migration, the number of migrants intending to illegally cross our border who have perished along the way, either en route to the United States or at the border, almost doubled during the tenure of Alejandro N. Mayorkas as Secretary of Homeland Security, from an average of about 700 a year during the fiscal years 2017 through 2020 to an average of about 1,300 a year during fiscal year 2021 through 2023. Alien Four alien smuggling organizations have gained tremendous wealth during Alejandro N. Mayorkas' tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, with their estimated revenues rising 
from about $500 million in 2018 to approximately $13 billion in 2022. During five, during Alejandro N. Mayorkas' tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, the immigration court backlog has more than doubled from about 1,300,000 cases to over 3 million cases. The exploding backlog is destroying the court's ability to administer justice and provide appropriate relief in a time frame that does not run into years or even decades. As Alejandro and Mayorkas acknowledged, quote, those who have a valid claim to asylum often wait years for a decision. Likewise, non-citizens who will ultimately be found ineligible for asylum or other protection, which occurs in the majority of cases, often have spent many years in the United States prior to being ordered removed, end quote. He noted that of aliens placed in expedited removal proceedings and found to have a credible fear of persecution and thus referred to immigration judges for removal proceedings, quote, significantly fewer than 20% were ultimately granted asylum, end quote. And only 28%, quote, 28% of cases decided on their merits are granted are grants of relief. Alejandro N. Mayorkas also admitted, quote, the fact that migrants can wait in the United States for years before being issued a final order denying relief and that many such individuals are never actually removed likely incentivizes migrants to make the journey north, end quote. During Alejandro N. Mayorkas' tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, approximately 450,000 unaccompanied alien children have been encountered at the southwest border, and the vast majority have been released into the United States. As a result, there has been a dramatic upsurge in migrant children being employed in dangerous and exploitive jobs in the United States. Seven, Alejandro N. Mayorkas' failure to enforce the law, drawing millions of illegal aliens to the southwest border, has led to the reassignment of U.S. Border Patrol agents from protecting the border from illicit drug trafficking to processing illegal aliens for release. As a result, during Alejandro N. Mayorkas' tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, the flow of fentanyl across the border and other dangerous drugs, both at, the, at and between ports of entry, has increased dramatically. U.S. Customs and Border Protection seized approximately 4,800 pounds of fentanyl in fiscal year 2020, approximately 11,200 pounds in fiscal year 2021, approximately 14,700 pounds in fiscal year 22, and approximately 27,000 pounds in fiscal year 23. Over 70,000 Americans died from fentanyl poisoning in 2022, and fentanyl is now the number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18 and 45. Eight, Alejandro and Mayorkas has degraded public safety by leaving <clears throat> wide swaths of the border effectively unpatrolled as, as U.S. Border Patrol agents are diverted from guarding the border to processing for unlawful release the heightening waves of apprehended aliens, many who now seek out agents for the purpose of surrendering with the now reasonable expectation of being released and granted work authorization. And federal air marshals are diverted from protecting the flying public to assist in such processing. Nine, during Alejandro N. Mayorkas' tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, U.S. Border Patrol has encountered an increasing number of aliens on the terrorist watch list. In fiscal years 2017 through 2020, combined 11 non-citizens on the terrorist watch list were caught attempting We have to been the listening to the articles of impeachment against uh, Department of Homeland Security, Alejandro, uh, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This is a historic moment. It's why we are in there listening to all of these articles of impeachment. It is uh, the second time in U.S. history where a cabinet member is being impeached. The accusations are uh, that he committed high crimes and misdemeanors uh, because of not implementing according to those seeking to impeach him, which uh, after it passed in, in the House is a majority of Republicans in the House. Now they're, they've transferred these articles to the Senate to hopefully, according to them, begin a trial. It is unlikely that the trial will even begin, as uh, Scott McFarlane was uh, detailing. 
because Democrats in the Senate, which are a majority, see this as just a political uh, strategy and theater. I want to bring in Camilo Montoya Galvez. Camilo uh, is our uh, CBS News immigration uh, reporter. You've been at the border consistently over the last several weeks and months. Camilo, you have seen with your own eyes and through your reporting those consequences of policies that we were hearing there. These are consequences of policies, but are, they're being articulated in a way that is accusing the Department of Homeland Security uh, secretary of, of basically committing crimes. There is so much there to fact check. Um, I, I, I'm not going to make you fact check all the numbers, but talk to us about some of those policies, uh, sure. namely things like granting, granting parole uh, to perhaps too many people, not detaining uh, people according to the law who crossed unlawfully. What stood, uh, what, what, what stuck out there from, from what was being read? And, and is that due to a direct failure of the Homeland Security Secretary, or is that sure. how the law is written? Well, Lilia, as you know, as this is the case with most debates on immigration, what was articulated by the impeachment manager is much more complicated and, in many ways, it lacked necessary nuance and context. It is true that Customs and Border Protection has recorded a record number of migrant apprehensions along the U.S.-Mexico border since President Biden took office, including over 2 million in fiscal year 2023. That is an all-time high. That is true. But it is also true, Lilia, that not every single one of those migrants are still here in the U.S. because the Biden administration has also been carrying out record levels of expulsions and deportations of migrants. Many of these migrants have been released, but some of these migrants have been returned to Mexico or to their home countries. In fact, the Biden administration has carried out more than 600,000 expulsions, deportations and removals in the past year alone. So that is also true. We also have to underscore that spikes in migration along the border have bedeviled different presidents across different administrations, Republican and Democratic alike. President Obama faced a spike in unaccompanied children and families going to the border in 2014 and in 2015. And President Trump himself faced a spike in migrant families from Central America's Northern Triangle in 2019. It is also important to underscore that the lawmaker here is saying that the Biden administration and its policies are directly to blame for the crisis at the border. And it is important to note that there is a perception that the Biden administration is more lenient on migrants than other administrations, particularly the Trump administration, and that may be playing a role in more migrants coming to the U.S.-Mexico border. But that is not the single catalyst. And that it's certainly argument, not the full story. I mean, right. And that we, argument, yeah. Lilia, ignores conditions in home countries exactly. like Venezuela, which has seen its economy collapse. It has a repressive government, and 7 million Venezuelans have left that country over the past year. So that is the largest refugee exodus in this hemisphere. And the majority of them are not coming to the United States. The That's majority right. of them are staying in countries like There are of, millions like of Venezuelans Colombia. in Colombia. Yeah. There's a million Venezuelans in Ecuador. Many of them are living in Peru, Chile, Brazil, and other parts of Latin America. And some, yes, have come here to the U.S., but you also have deteriorating conditions politically and economically in places like Cuba, in places yeah. like Haiti, Nicaragua, in parts of Africa. Many Africans are coming to the U.S. border after traversing most of Latin America and Mexico to get here. So country conditions are also yeah. playing a role in this crisis at the border. There's also another factor that lawmakers are not underscoring, and that is that the U.S. economy has recovered at a higher rate from the pandemic than other economies, and there are very acute labor demands here, many job openings. Yeah. And because of the strength of the U.S. economy, many migrants are coming here to work. So while some of them may not be asylum seekers, they're coming here to work because of the strength of the U.S. economy, not necessarily because of Biden administration policy, which, again, may be playing a role, but it is not the single catalyst. That, that context is so important, Camilo. I mean, we've seen a nearly 400 increase in, in homicides uh, per 100,000 citizens in, in Ecuador, which equates to a 400 percent increase in people from Ecuador seeking uh, to yes. come to the United States. We can talk about inflation. We can talk about so many reasons that, as you and I know, because we cover the region, are what push people 
to, to come to the United States. I want to bring uh, Nicole Killian, who is now on camera joining us there from Capitol Hill. And I want to talk a little bit about what we are seeing, Nicole, what we've heard, uh, how this whole uh, process plays out of impeaching a cabinet member and what do we expect will happen from here once the manager is done reading uh, all what I have here are eight pages of the articles of impeachment. Yeah, well, as we have been watching, it is Chairman uh, Mark Green of the Homeland Security Committee over in the House who has been reading the resolution which contains the two articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas for willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law. That is the first article. And a breach of public trust is the second article. So we have heard him read out uh, the uh, evidence if you will, that his committee has gathered over the course of the last year or so to put together these two articles of impeachment. Now, we were expecting potentially these House impeachment managers, all 11 of them who you see walking over to the Senate chamber earlier. We were expecting them to walk back over to the House chamber, but uh, we have since been told that that may or may not happen because they have started allowing members of the public back into the Capitol Rotunda, where I was previously standing. So uh, that being said, in terms of next steps, uh, the real question at hand is whether or not the Senate will proceed with an impeachment trial. That is customary. That is typically how the process works. Uh, we are expecting that senators would be sworn in for a potential trial as soon as tomorrow. But there have been a lot of discussions within uh, the last few hours here about whether or not they should should potentially, for instance, allow a debate over whether to move forward with an impeachment trial. That is something, for instance, that Senator Mitt Romney has been calling for, even though he also has previously said he does not believe that the offenses the alleged offenses uh, cited against the secretary rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. But he does feel that this process should be allowed to play out in the sense of at least having a debate over whether or not to move forward. So that is kind of some of the discussions that are being had behind closed doors uh, between Senate Republicans in their respective conference, as well as uh, among Senate Democrats. Ultimately, that's going to be a decision that is up to leadership to decide if they decide to come to some type of agreement between the two parties that would allow a certain amount of time for debate uh, before they decide whether or not to move forward with impeachment. They can still move to dismiss this trial or table it. But again, it sounds mm. like some senators are at least wanting to have a debate about the process. So that is what we are watching for in terms of next steps. Will senators be entitled to that debate or will they just be sworn in? And again, we see some type of motion to dismiss this, some type of motion to table, or do they move forward with a full trial? Again, in terms of Senate Democrats, they want to move past this. Leader yeah. Schumer has made clear, again, that he feels that this is simply a matter of policy differences and issues, and that impeachment is not the proper vehicle to resolve these issues. And that, too, sets a troubling precedent every time there is a policy disagreement if there is an impeachment trial. So that is the precedent that Leader Schumer is concerned about. But many congressional what? Republicans, both Senate Republicans and House Republicans, including Chairman Green, who has been reading those articles, argue is that it sets a dangerous precedent if you don't have a trial, because <laughs> that, again, has has been customary, and that has been how the process has worked. So the bottom line is the Senate's going to have to figure it out. Do this they allow some type of debate to advance to decide whether or not they're even going to consider a trial, or do they just make a motion to squash it altogether? And again, that is the decision that is ultimately up to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. One thing that is important is to have a debate over immigration. And it's certainly, I mean, it seems like that is what uh, Senator Romney's talking about. 
this country has not passed comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, there needs to be a debate. And Congress, in impeaching a cabinet member, is in a way sending a message that it is not up to us, but it is up to them to pass laws. It is up to them to pass funding to solve the very problems that are being cited in, in these articles of impeachment. Camilo, can you talk to us about what are some of those most urgent policies that outside of this kind of impeachment process would or have been part of the conversation when it comes to a desperately needed comprehensive immigration reform in this country, if you don't mind detailing some of those? Well, Lily, I think most experts would agree that the immigration system is in desperate need of reform and that Congress has ignored updating the system for decades. The last law passed by Congress that updated U.S. border policy was in 1996. The last time Congress updated the legal immigration system was in 1990. The last time Congress really uh, made an amnesty for unauthorized or undocumented immigrants in the U.S. was in the 80s during the Reagan administration. And so this is an issue that Congress has not acted on in any significant major way for decades. And this has led to the system being under-resourced, outdated, mm -hmm. and it has prevented administrations, Republican and Democrat alike, from addressing these very vexing and incredibly difficult challenges, especially at the U.S.-Mexico border. The asylum system is just not designed, Lilia, to address these extraordinary flows of migration and displacement that we are seeing across the region and along the U.S.-Mexico border. The U.S. simply does not have the resources, the personnel to screen everyone for asylum, to return people who are not eligible, to grant asylum to people who are in need of protection, and it does not have the legal immigration system that would allow some of these people who may not qualify for asylum to come here to work, to provide for their families in a legal and orderly way. And obviously, Congress right now is more focused, as we know, on these partisan Politics, yes. Tactics, yeah. Absolutely. Than addressing the issue in a bipartisan way. I, I was looking for the right that, word, but, that but that, is, that's the right word, yeah. It is a fair <laughs> assessment. It is partisan politics, and I think everybody on both sides would agree on all sides. Uh, yes, certainly people who are forced here out of desperation end up having to use the asylum system because there isn't one, uh, a healthy one, of work permits. And the jobs sure are here, mm -hmm. the demand uh, and the supply are here, too. Camilo, Nicole, thank you so much for that comprehensive uh, reporting and breakdown. Much appreciated. We're going to be right back with more on this and also jury selection underway in the Trump criminal trial here in New York City. Stay with us. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone.